The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer greatly from the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed and on the third day, be raised. Then Peter took Jesus aside, began to rebuke him. God forbid, Lord, no such thing shall ever happen to you. He turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an obstacle to me. You are thinking not as God does, but as human beings do. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wishes to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What profit would there be for one to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? Or what can one give in exchange for his life? For the Son of Man will come with his angels in his Father's glory, and then he will repay all according to his conduct. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning, everybody. I'm pumped to open up the scriptures with you today because they're so rich. And the two words that speak out the most to me that summarize the focus of this reflection are be transformed, as we hear St. Paul talk about that in the second reading. Growing up, the biggest influence of my life was that transformed me was not faith and family, it was not religion and spirituality, but sports and music. The superstars in these industries and other secular revolutionaries who are like icons of popular culture are the ones who most appeal to my sense of inspiration and purpose. They were the ones who most formed the development of my personality on the level of mentality and lifestyle. I think this rings true for most people, including those like myself brought up in our pews. We hear from St. Paul in which he says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 to 2, one of my favorite verses, do not be conformed to this age. We tend to be seduced by the trends of our time, to want more than anything to be popular, cool, or successful according to our current standards, to be more a friend of the world than a friend of the Lord. When I first came back to the faith and I began to read the scriptures for the first time on my own, not simply passively sitting in the pew where it went in one ear and out the other, but to actually start to read it for myself and allow it to sink in more than ever. And I was struck by certain verses that I was like, oh my gosh, how did I not know this? And one of those such verses that really helped put my past into perspective in terms of the, spirit, the sense of being transformed by Christ's mercy 
is when the Apostle James in chapter 4, verse 4 to 8 says, Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Resist the devil, and he will take flight. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. In the gospel, we hear Jesus resisting the devil. And the devil, without St. Peter knowing it, though St. Peter probably had good intentions, the devil was still able to work through his good intentions in a way that was trying to lead Jesus away from the cross, away from his purpose. And so Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Because without Peter knowing it, the enemy was using him as an instrument to try to deceive Jesus. And our Lord, after this rebuke of the devil by which he takes flight, the Lord Jesus says, what good is it to gain the whole world and to lose your soul? That was another one of those verses that struck me to the core after my conversion. When I was growing up, a common expression for us in hip-hop culture was sellout. Sellout is like the worst loser possible. Someone who, a sellout is like someone who compromises their authentic self and their integrity the integrity of their art, their craft, themselves, for the sake of just making bucks, just getting a bigger paycheck. It's a sellout. In sports, in the 90s, we saw a big thing with steroids. Growing up in the Bay, my superstar heroes were the Bash brothers, uh, Jose Canseco and Mark McGuire for the, the, Golden, the A's. Later come to find out that they were shooting up steroids. On the other side of the bay, one of the greatest baseball players ever um, for the Giants. Why am I, Willie Mays' godson, why am I going blank? Barry Bonds. So Barry Bonds, super talented already as a pirate, and then all of a sudden he starts shooting up with steroids. And he sells out. And it just totally compromises their character and everything that they were striving for um, as an athlete. But there's an even worse way of selling out, which is actually quite common again, and that's selling your soul to the devil. And surprisingly, without going into that, because I've, without going into the details of that, there's surprisingly a lot of people in the music industry that have admitted to doing so in interviews. And if we don't believe what they say in their interviews, we know a tree by its fruit, and so much of their music videos show all of this, let alone Sam Smith's performance at the Grammys. So Satanism is at an all-time high and unprecedented degree in society today. And this is a real thing, selling your soul. That's the ultimate selling out. What good is it to gain the whole world? The four values of the worldly person, according to St. Thomas Aquinas, where we could sell out more subtly than something extreme like that, which we don't even, most of us don't even want to think about, but it is real. But more subtle ways is when we value as ends in themselves, as ultimate goals, pleasure, wealth, power, and honor. These are the four values, according to St. Thomas Aquinas, of the worldly person. To word it in a different way, self-gratification, money, control, vanity. We have to understand the difference between our wants and our needs. What good is it to own over 20 pairs of the most expensive shoes and yet be going nowhere? In life. That was Deion Sanders used that one when he gave his testimony. He said, I got over 200 pairs of shoes in my closet, but I'm going nowhere in my life. 
What good is it to possess all possible popularity and success and yet still feel empty? What good is it to own a big, beautiful home and still feel alone? What most appeals, speaks, and feeds my soul and not just my ego is an important way of understanding the difference between wants and needs. Jesus is saying, what good is it to gain the whole world and to what? Lose your soul. No amount of pleasure, wealth, power, or honor is worth the loss of our soul, selling out. The loss of our identity as a precious and pure beloved child of God. The loss of our dignity as made in the beauty of his image and likeness. What good is it to have all that our hearts could possibly desire in regards to name brand clothes, fancy cars, big houses, expensive vacations, and a prestigious career, if in the end I only find that I'm a slave to myself and what other people think of me with no real friends. Jim Carrey talks, he has this famous quote that I didn't have a chance to look up. But he says something like, I wish everybody could experience for at least one day what it means to be a millionaire and how unsatisfying it is, how it doesn't fill the hole in our soul. What good is it to think that I am powerful and in control as an independent postmodern man or woman or non-binary if in the end I only discover that my life was a lie? A fantasy, not reality. St. Paul says to be transformed. How? By the renewal of our mind. Our transformation begins by changing the way we think, our vision, our opinions, our values, our attitudes, our knowledge of the truth. Not as something subjective, but as that we invent based on our desires but something that we discover by God's revelation, a truth, the truth that is unchanging and not simply subjective and relative. To be transformed by the renewal of our mind that we may discern what is God's will, and God's will is not something that is meant to be a burden or opposed to our happiness. It's the opposite. God's will has our happiness in mind. God's will is the wisdom to bring about our fulfillment. What is good, pleasing, and perfect. To go from good to better to best. And what is true, good, and beautiful. That's God's will, love and mercy itself. But we have to discern that because there's so many influences that, that try to give us an understand, a different understanding of the truth or what God is okay with. To discern is to separate the authentic from the counterfeit, the real from the fake, the goats from the sheep. To know the difference between that which speaks to our flesh versus that which speaks to our spirit. To know the difference between what feeds our ego and what feeds our heart. Jesus said, to St. Peter, when he rebuked him, you're thinking as human beings do, not as God does. How easy it is for us to justify certain things in our comfort zones that, not be, may, not may, be, that may not be pleasing to God, to justify it, but in a way that isn't in alignment with what God knows is best for us. To learn how to think as God does, not as human beings do. When the world says, oh, it's totally fine, it's okay, that's normal. Everybody's doing it. By comparing ourselves to others as the standard of whether or not I'm living a good life. Because I'm not doing, that's how I was for many years, 
thinking that I was in pretty good shape morally because I compared myself to those in my crowd who were doing worse soft things. But the other people aren't the standard. What other people say is not the standard. Christ's love and truth is the standard. And that's not meant to make us feel guilty. It's meant to set us free. The Alleluia verse says, enlighten the eyes of our heart. Why? That like Jeremiah, that our hearts may burn with the fire of God's love. A true knowledge of God's will, our Lord's word. Like the responsorial psalm, that by coming to have the eyes of our heart enlightened, that we may be filled with the fire of a knowledge of God's will through his love, and that our spirit may thirst for the Lord our God. We may desire the Lord more than anything, as the responsorial psalm prayed. And it's then that we can, according to the words of St. Paul, offer our bodies as a living sacrifice pleasing to God. Our spiritual worship. In other words, there's only one sacrifice God desires of us that we give to him wholeheartedly all, that we, all of who we are and all that we do. All of who we are and all that we do is offered to him, saying, Lord, here's all of me for all of you. Your will be done. That's to offer our lives, our bodies, as a living sacrifice to God, to worship him in spirit and truth. Not by lip service, not by just showing up and sitting in the pew for an hour, but what we do every other hour and moment outside of these walls. That's true worship. And we're all weak. We're all wounded. We're all sinners. We all battle against the flesh. But to want this more than anything is what matters. On this Labor Day weekend, we ask ourselves, what are we working for? And more importantly, who are we working for? God's glory or our own gain? Self-gratification. To love God above all or to be validated by others above all? The greatest labor of love this world has ever known or will ever know is what we celebrate in the Eucharist every Sunday and sometimes for some of us every day. The greatest labor of love is Christ crucified. The sacrifice of Christ's life, the offering of his body in pure, perfect worship of the Father, representing all humanity. This reveals how deep are the depths of God's love towards us, how much he wants to be one with us. And there's no price he is willing to pay that he is not willing to pay in order to bring that about. It is this divine love which alone gives eternal life to our souls, made for nothing less than the ultimate best. Not simply lifestyle, life substance. Without the cross, we are lost. The cross is the cost of Pentecost, our hope of being transformed in the light and life of God's fire of everlasting love. Like St. Peter in today's gospel, our human nature doesn't understand the value of the cross in our lives. It often makes no sense, it is, and yet it is part of God's indispensable recipe to bring about the forgiveness of our sins and make us worthy of our most exalted destiny. Our fallen nature is cowardly, easily afraid of suffering and often tries to escape the cross. Yet to run away from the cross is to run away from union with Christ, our only crown. In conclusion, we are, who are easily influenced to be formed most not by the values and standards of our faith in Christ, but by the mindsets and appealing lifestyles of popular culture. 
We're called today to be transformed, to become like fire, the fire of love blazing in the heart of Jesus, to give glory to his eternal Father, and to save souls who will sing of the wonders of his mercies for all eternity.